And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. Mark is mentioned, a mark or, or, or human beings being marked. This actually occurs quite a few times in the Bible. So before we actually get into Revelation chapter number 13, we need to first lay the groundwork and we need to first understand the foundation of this doctrine. Uh, Leviticus chapter number 19 verse number 28 actually gives us the definition. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. What is a mark? If you mark on something, what is that? Well, it's a print. It's, it's putting a print on something. So when we look at the Bible, the Bible defines it the same way in which we understand this word and it's commonly used today. A mark is a print. That's why he makes the statement, nor print any marks <coughs> upon you. In Genesis chapter number 4, we have the mention of a mark. This is the very first time that a person is marked and they actually have a mark put on them. And the, this mark is given by the Lord and it's put upon Cain. Now what was the purpose? It was so that if anybody found him, they would not kill him. How and which are they going to know not to kill him? By what? By the mark. So, you know what that tells me is that this is a mark just like Leviticus 19, 28 explains it. Do you know what it is? It's a printed mark. How would they be able to do this? Well, of course, because it is visible. Just like, you know, cuttings in the flesh, just like printing a mark upon you. When they see him, they know not to touch him because of this mark. This is how you learn the Bible. You learn what the Bible is teaching about as you compare Scripture with Scripture. And then we go and we look at the mark of the beast. And I believe if people were to do that, they would spare themselves from a lot of error. Because a lot of times they just isolate one passage. And you know what they do? They spend 90% on modern technology. 90% of their time, time is spent on looking at the new technology that could possibly be implemented to be the mark of the beast. No, we need to go to the Bible first. And then it's fine to do that later. But this needs to be our authority. We begin here. We understand. We have a sound understanding of what the Bible teaches. And then go and look at maybe what technology could be. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 9. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. It says, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men. So we have the exact same statement, so we can see this consistency here. And notice that it says it's on the foreheads. Where is it going to take place in Revelation chapter number 13? Either on the right hand or on the foreheads. So we can see that this is definitely tied with Revelation chapter number 13. This mark again is a mark of the Lord. And the Lord is saying to mark these men. Now again, also, who is being spared and who is being salvaged? It's the one that has the mark. The one that actually receives the mark in his forehead is the one that's going to be spared. So this is something printed. I want you to notice that the men that were going to kill, they were actually going and they were visibly looking and identifying the men that had the mark. And then they saw, hey, these other guys don't have the mark. All right, smite them. So also, another thing. This is very interesting because there's a lot of consistency. The people that don't have the mark are to die. What did Cain say? Well, I don't want to die. Okay, give him a mark. So notice this vast consistency over and over and over again here. So it's printed, literally printed. It's written with a writer's inkhorn. It's visible. We see it's on their forehead. It makes sense that it would be on Cain's forehead to be obvious. It is meant to identify and it's meant to, in the sense of identify, distinguish or differentiate those that have the mark and those that do not have the mark. And it's also meant for protection. I want to first explain a couple things to you that people will, you know, uh, 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 you know, 
teach wrongly. They'll, they'll misteach and, and uh, you know, false doctrine when it comes to the book of Revelation and the, the mark of the beast. Some people will say <coughs> that this was fulfilled already. And what, because what they have to do <coughs> is they have to centralize everything and isolate all these teachings to just Jerusalem only. And when we look at Revelation chapter number 13, this mark is being issued to everyone in the entire world. It's not just centralized to Jerusalem. This is being given to everyone in the entire world. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So I want you to notice that. When it says, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, it's not just talking about people that are in Jerusalem because it's talking about those that are worshiping him. And who is worshiping him? The entire world. And notice that how are they worshiping him? Does it tell you later in the chapter, Revelation 13? They worship him through the image of the beast. They actually bow down to this image. You're not just going to go down to your local, you know, technology store, electronic store and just receive this mark, whatever technology it may be. Or the pharmacy, if you try to tie it in with, you know, medicinal or some sort of surgeon or something or Walmart. That's not how this is going to work. You are going to actually have to worship and bow down to the image of the beast and the beast in order to receive the mark. And once you do that, now you have, that's why it's called the mark of the beast. You have been identified with the beast now. Look at Revelation chapter number 13. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So he mentions that you must worship the image of the beast and then he follows that up with and he causes. So this is another thing that he does in tandem with or simultaneously with worshiping the image of the beast. He's going to cause you to receive a mark in your right hand or your forehead. And you cannot buy or sell without that mark. The way in which you receive the mark is that it is coupled together with worshiping the image of the beast. So that this is an important truth. People are wrong about this very often because people are, will ask the question, well, and of course people that preach and believe a false gospel, of well, if you believe in once saved, always saved, how's this going to work out? Christians cannot lose their salvation. They couldn't in the past, they couldn't in the Old Testament, they can't in the New Testament, they can in the tribulation. You can never lose your salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Amen. That is the Bible's teaching on the gospel. You are saved eternally forever. And people ask the question, well, what about those that, you know, take the mark of the beast that are saved? You know, here's the, here's the easy answer. No one is going to, everyone that's saved, is, is not going to worship the image of the beast. And they are not going to take the mark of the beast. Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 24 says this, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So what is that teaching? Why did it say, if it were possible? Saying it's going to be so great and so magnificent, these wonders are going to be so powerful that if it were possible, they would, they would deceive the very elect. What does that tell you? It's not possible. One prominent religious movement based in Davos City has taken its interpretation further than others. The Kingdom of Jesus Christ, led by Apollo Kiboloy. Praise the Father. Who am I? I am the new owner of the world. Pastor Kibuloy considers Davao to be the new Jerusalem. The second coming is going to take place there. This is a process of localization of a global faith, making it truly Filipino. Pastor Apollo Kibuloy makes the claim that he himself is the appointed son of God in the 21st century. In a remote corner of the vast Siberian wilderness lives a Russian mystic who describes himself as the son and word of God. Спаситель по-другому можно называть Христос. Христос переводится как Спаситель. From his mountainside abode, deep in an almost impenetrable forest, the Russian mystic leads a community of 5,000 disciples, spread over an area with a radius of 300 kilometers. 
and I ask why he, Christ, needed to come back. Учение не было дано учение, был только призыв оставлен в общий рассказ о Боге. Alan John Miller, or AJ as he likes to be known, believes he is Jesus and he's deadly serious. The Roman soldiers weren't certain as to whether I died or not yet, and so they actually speared the side of my body uh, up into the heart. So can you describe to me why you believe that you are Jesus of Nazareth? Well, I don't believe I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I, I know I'm Jesus of Naz Nazareth. Because their spiritual leader says he is the Antichrist, not the embodiment of evil, but rather the second coming. 666, Antichrist means do not put your eyes on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Put it in Jesus after the cross. And that's you? That's me. And he says the word Antichrist is a bad translation of a word that actually means the new Christ, the second coming. Puerto Rican-born Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda founded the sect 20 years ago in a warehouse outside Miami. You receive it, you accept it, you confess it, and it's done unto you. I do greater things than Jesus of Nazareth, much greater. Revelation 13, 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, now watch this, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Notice, everybody else besides those whose names are written in the book of life. Saying, everyone who's in the book of life, they are not going to worship the, the beast and the image of the beast. You know what that means? They're not going to receive the mark. That's exactly... <clears throat> what that's teaching. That's why Jesus in John chapter number 10 said that <clears throat> they that are his sheep, they won't follow the voice of a stranger. He says that, you know, that they, they, know, they know his voice and, and that we will follow him, but the voice of a stranger we don't know and we will not follow the voice of a stranger. You know who a stranger is? The Antichrist. This guy that shows up and says, hey, I'm the Christ. But you, we won't be deceived by that. We'll know that this is not Jesus and we'll know that this is not the Christ. What is the devil's objective? And this actually explains things uh, from what we just read about the devil you know, uh, uh, issuing this mark and can a Christian take the mark? What is the devil's objective and what is his goal uh, during this time period? Is his goal to try to get Christians to convert? and to worship him? No. Because the devil knows the Bible probably better than you and me. That's why he's quoting scripture off the top of his head to Jesus. The devil knows the scriptures very, very well. So he knows the Bible, right? And the devil is aware of salvation and that it's eternal. That's why he tries to convince people that it's not. Because he knows the truth and he tries to deter them from the truth. So that's not his goal. His goal is actually to make war with the saints. His goal is actually to hurt and to destroy and to persecute and to bring tribulation upon those that are the Christians and the saints. And he wants to get rid of them so he can rule in his kingdom. That's the whole purpose of what he's doing. Revelation 13, 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's not trying to say, hey, come on my side. He's trying to make war with them and destroy them. Do you know why he put the mark upon them? The same reason why the Lord put the mark upon his enemies or upon those that were, I'm sorry, put the mark upon those that were actually his followers. So the devil, notice it's exactly the same, is, is placing a mark upon his followers, upon those that are willing to worship him so that he can kill everybody else. What did the Lord do? What did God do in Ezekiel 9? He placed a mark on all of those that were his children. And then he said, now everybody that doesn't have the mark, go and smite and slay all of them. And of course, Satan is the great imitator. He, he wants to be exactly like God. The devil wants to be exactly like the Lord. You know, God has his Christ. The devil has his Antichrist. You know, God is going to have his kingdom. The devil tries to set up his kingdom, right? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead. This man's going to have a deadly wound and die and then raised from the dead. He wants to be like the Most High, as we saw from last week. So why is he issuing this mark? Because he just wants to be exactly like the Lord. So, 
I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 20 now. So notice that, that mark. Now, we would have no reason to think that the word mark just changes meaning. And we're talking about a totally different subject all of a sudden. Just right here, this, the word mark here just means to something totally different. When you, you, you read all throughout the Bible that there's a mark given, it's visible, it's written, it's, it's printed with, a, with an ink horn upon their head. It uses the word print. It's meant to identify them. And then all of a sudden we get here, everything else is the same. Everything else, else lines up, but it's just not an actual mark now. The word mark's used, but it's not an actual mark. It's this or that. That's a dumb way to read the Bible. That's a very stupid way to read the Bible. Now, I know you're into technology, and hey, that can be interesting and stuff like that. But you know what I'm into? I'm into the Bible. He, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So notice that. Just like the Lord put it in their foreheads. And I heard uh, uh, you know, a very interesting uh, uh, interpretation of why it's in their right hand or their foreheads. And I agree with this. It's like, why one or the other? Well, one can be the primary, like the right hand, right? You can just install it right into their right hand. But why sometimes the foreheads? Well, does every single person have a right hand? No, they don't. But do you know what everybody has? If you're alive, you for sure have a forehead. If you're living and breathing, you definitely have a head. So you have a forehead. So I want to show you here in Revelation chapter number 20. It actually talks about the mark of the beast again. And uh, the interpretation that I've heard of, about you know, the mark of the beast and uh, what technology specifically it is, is I've heard that it is an RFID chip. This is what most people, it seems like, believe nowadays. That it's a microchip. And they, they will specifically point to the fact that in Revelation 13 it says in the right hand or in the forehead. They will reference the other modern Bible versions which will change that to on. And they will say that the reason why this was changed was from the devil coming in and corrupting this. And it's so that when the, the chips actually start rolling out, that all these false preachers, which are the devil's minions, they'll just say from their NIV, hey, look, it says on their right hand and on their forehead. This is going in your right hand or in your forehead. You have nothing to worry about. So they'll point out and they'll say, yeah, but it's in. It's in their right hand or in their foreheads. The change that all the other versions do is bad. Any changes is bad. The, but I don't need those I don't need those other versions. I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. What I'm about to show you is that it is in and it is on. It is both. And that's taught from a King James Bible 1611. The authorized version teaches that the mark of the beast can be either in and on. So that's a misunderstanding of what is taught. Look at Revelation chapter number 20. I want you to look at me at verse number 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. If we go back to Revelation 13, do you know what Revelation 13 says? It says, in their right hand, and then it says this, in their foreheads. I want you to notice what the Bible actually says right there. So when it says their hand again, yeah, it says in, just because it can use either one. But you know what it says about their foreheads this time? It says upon. It says upon. Now every other time Mark showed up, Ezekiel 9, Genesis 4, what did it use and how did it say it? What was, how was it described? Upon or on. So notice that interchangeably this mark can either be on in the forehead on in the hand. It can be either one. Now if that is just exclusively some type of chip that is in injected and just that chip alone, would that make sense even in that way? It would not. And would that be a mark by the just the, the traditional definition of a mark? Because the Bible says that it's nor print any marks upon you. Would that be printed on you? No, it wouldn't. It would not. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. 
obviously it's very clear. What is it referring to? You can use the word in when you're talking about something written. We may not do that in our English today, but the King James Bible clearly does over and over again. So the mark that he gives them, he decides to put it on their foreheads just like he decided to put it on their foreheads in Ezekiel 9. And notice that it's written in their foreheads, showing it's an actual mark. It's written just like a writer's inkhorn in Ezekiel chapter number 9. Revelation chapter number uh, uh, 22 and then uh, Revelation 3. I want you to look in Revelation 3 first. Look at verse number 12. It says this. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. And this is a prophecy of what the Lord will do to those that go to heaven and that achieve these rewards and goals. Well, it's actually talked about in Revelation 22, the, where this actually comes to fruition once we get to heaven. Look at Revelation 22, 3. Uh, keep in mind it said it, he will write upon them, right? Now look at Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Notice what was used interchangeable again. On and in, talking about in their foreheads, on their foreheads. Just like even for the mark of the beast. Now notice the consistency here. The Lord has something written on their foreheads, and it's for his people. And what is written on their foreheads? Specifically, his name. What does Satan, what does the Antichrist have written on their foreheads? In a tattoo parlor on trendy South Beach, you did the 666 really big? Yeah. sat the daughter of the man who claims to be God. He's back. He's here to teach us that we should reign in life, that there is no sin, and today we're honoring him with a symbol. Joanne de Jesus is one of several dozen members of a religious sect called Crescienda en Gracia, or Growing in Grace. They were tattooed on their arms, ankles, even their necks with 666, the biblical sign of the Antichrist. Now, sporting his new tattoos, Seis, 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 Triple S. Huh? De Jesus says those expecting the second coming of Christ on a cloud with angels have misinterpreted what Jesus himself said. He said it. You won't see me anymore because he will come in another body, which is me. He's in their head. He's inside the heads of those people. De Jesus is dangerous, says religion professor Daniel Alvarez, because he believes he's God. And this megalomaniacal uh, moves are the ones that are very disturbing because it shows that he does believe he's on hype and he's capable of saying to his members, go to 2666 on your arm. I believe he's also capable of asking his church members to do even something more dramatic. So it's printed. It's meant to be visible. It's meant to identify and differentiate. That's the, pu the purpose. It's meant to control also. It's meant as a means of control. And it's also meant to give amnesty or protection to those that have the mark. The mark seals you. That's what it does. The mark seals you. Now, if you take the mark of the devil, yeah, you'll receive protection from him temporarily. But, and it does seal you. It damns your soul for all eternity. And uh, we're not going to turn to that. But Revelation chapter 14 tells us very clearly that those that take the mark of the beast and the number of his name, that they are going to be damned for all eternity in Revelation chapter number 14. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, the technology, whatever technology it ends up being, and I think that there are a lot of options out there, it has to uh, include in some way a mark. However you want to look at this, there is going to be a printed mark 
that comes with the chip. There's going to be a printed mark that comes with whatever it may be. This project is referred to or called ID2020, as I mentioned in the title of the sermon, ID2020. Today, more than half the planet has access to the internet. Still more have access to mobile devices. So more and more our relationships with institutions and with each other take place in digital spaces. So while digital ID is at its core exactly what it sounds like, using digital technology to prove that you are you, if you interact with technology, any technology connected to the internet, you have a digital identity. So the question isn't if digital identity will happen. It's already happening. The real question is how. Their goal and their objective is to create a digital certificate and a digital identity to every single human being. Like that is their goal. They want every single person to be digitally certified and digitally tracked and have a digital identity, every single person. ID 2020. This is not some tin foil conspiracy. Look it up, look up ID 2020. You can find out all the information that I did. I didn't get any of my information from some sort of alternative news source, none of it. You know, I looked up and, and listened to news reports of these people explaining what they're, what they're trying to do, their projects. I read it right off of their, their uh, uh, website. You can look up ID2020. It'll take you to their website, look up their goals and objectives. And you know what this is? This is the precursor to the Mark of the Beast. This is a system. Now, I don't know how they're going to be digitally scanning this. I don't know how this is going to be exactly taking place, but this system it is a system where they are going to digitally certify every human being on the planet. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor. Every person, everybody on the earth, everybody on the earth, every single person is going to be digitally certified and logged into a system. And it's just going to, it's going to begin with are, hey, have you been vaccinated? We're just going to have your social security number, your cell phone, your address. It's just basic information, right? That's, you know, that, I don't even want to give you my stinking cell phone number, buddy. But that's where it's going to begin, all of that. And whatever, <coughs> they're, going to, they're going to have to have some way to identify it. You know, some sort of device or something like that. So this is the precursor of a, of a system or a log in which they are going to be able to store every single person's information in the entire world. One of the other things you're going to find out on their website are the people that back, the backers or supporters of their organization. And they are some of the most powerful men in the world. One of the, one of the backers is <clears throat> two of them, Microsoft and Gavi. Now who is the owner and the founder of Microsoft? Bill Gates. He's Gates was talking about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and how they're tackling COVID-19. Now, one of his answers was about people safely returning to work. He wrote that a system of, quote, digital certificates could be used to show if you've already been tested or eventually vaccinated. And that answer went viral. You know what? He made a statement the other day. He said this. He said, eventually we will have some sort of, and this is in light of recent events. He said, eventually we will have some sort of digital certificates that go out to all to show who has recovered, talking about the coronavirus, or been tested recently. Or, when we have a vaccine, who has received it. But, for the world at large, normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated the entire global population. And, and Hey, I'm not saying that this is the mark of the beast that's coming now, but do you know what this is? This is the forerunner, and it really is. This is the precursor. It's the system that's being implemented so that it's that much easier. When we get to the point of the, the beast showing up, the technology's already there. In a day, he can just plug in what he wants and say, hey, now you gotta come and worship me. We've deactivated everything. You know, whatever the digital certification is. Now when you come, the way you're going to access your digital information 
is it's no longer going to be maybe something we carry around a fob or something, whatever it is. Now it's going to be a mark. And you're going to have to come, and you're going to have to go here, and the, the, image, the image of the beast is going to be set up in all these different locations. There'll be different hubs in your local region that you have this amount of time that you need to show up. And we'll use this as a census where we can re-log and re-digitally certify every human being and identify each person. And the way to be recertified is that you're going to have to receive this new mark. This new mark that's going to take place. And obviously it would be the mark of the beast. You think that we are losing freedoms now and we're beginning to live in an or, or, you know, an Orwellian nightmare. You have no clue what's coming. They're going to be hunting down and persecuting Christians and the purpose is going to be find those that won't worship the beast. And it'll be fed to you under the guise of security for everybody else and stability for everybody else. And let me tell you this, that if you're not willing to take a vaccination, mark my words that this is going to become a major problem in the next two to three years in the United States. Because this is, this is not the end of this. If you are not willing to take a vaccination in the United States of America, you will be the enemy of the people. They, they already hate all, they already look at everyone like they're a threat, like you're this possible asymptomatic carrier of this deadly boogeyman virus. And they view each other, they're viewing everyone like, like you're some kind of monster. Can you imagine how they would act towards you if you were not vaccinated, everybody's willing to take the vaccine, but you're like, no, I'm not vaccinated. Do you know what they would say about you? You know how they would look at you and treat you? You know how scared people are about this virus and they're already irrational and unreasonable? They would, you would be even more so their enemy. You know how easy it would be when the whole world or the, all of the nation in this context is on their side, how easy it would be to mandate a vaccination? That's what's going on right now is they are push, pushing these vaccines. And that's going to be the next step. Mark my words. This is headed towards mandatory vaccinations. That is what's going to happen. That is going to be the way that they implement this technology which will ultimately, will certainly ultimately be used in end times Bible, to fulfill end times Bible prophecy. I want, you to, I want to end on a positive note. Those that victoriously turn down the mark of the beast. You know what you need to do is you need to make up your mind and set already in your heart that you're not, you couldn't take it if you wanted to. I don't know how this is going to work. But you need to be ready to stand up courageously and boldly when this gets offered, if you're alive during that time period. I want to stand for the witness of Christ. I want to use this as an opportunity to say, no, I'm not taking this mark. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, can, you can do whatever you want to do to me. You can behead me. You can kill my family. I'm not taking the mark and reject it. Now, where I can stand up for the Lord and stand before the beast and the son of perdition and reject it and refuse it and tell him, no, I am not worshiping your image. I am not worshiping the, you know, the, the beast. Not happening. I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will serve him and him only. And you know what? If my God won't deliver me, I'm still not going to worship your image. If I die being beheaded, that's what's going to happen. You're never putting any kind of mark on me. Not happening. So there's those that are, are victorious over the mark of the beast. And that's what we need to look toward. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So notice these men refused it. They were confronted with it, and they said, No, we will not. We will not worship the image. We will not worship the beast. And it says this, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Look at Revelation 15, and let's end there. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Notice those had the testimony. Notice those stood for the word of God. That's the group that I want to be in. 
I want to stand for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to stand there and when they ask me, do you know the man? I'm going to say, yes, I know him. But when I'm put in that position, I want to do what's right. And say, hey, do you know him? You're a Galilean. I'm going to say, yeah, I'm a Galilean. Yes, I know him. I'm going to stand for the word of God and for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ if I get the opportunity. So we need to be alert. We need to be awake. We need to be watching this and be ready. And you know what? More importantly, don't, we don't need to spend our time in the news all the time. You know what we need to do? We need to spend our time in this book and read the book of Revelation a little bit more. Study these subjects. Be familiar with the topics. You know, that's why it says, we, the, the passage that we, that we read, <coughs> I believe it's in the book of Hosea, he said, write it and make it clear so that he that sees it can run. Make the vision clear so when he sees it, he can run. Saying he can be warned. That's why we have the book of Revelation. God wants you to be familiar with this. Be familiar with it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. But this better model of digital identity will not emerge spontaneously from the technology. Quite the contrary. Instead, widespread agreement on principles, technical design, and interoperability standards is needed for decentralized digital identities to be effective, recognized, and trusted. And this requires sustained, transparent public-private partnership to set the future course of digital ID and to navigate its risks. This is a human challenge, not a technical challenge, and it requires human cooperation and collaboration.